Good evening. So thank you all for joining us. This is the first uh, webinar series, first of the webinars from the National Neonatology Forum Emirates branch. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for uh, joining us this evening. And uh, I welcome you uh, very warmly along with my colleagues in the scientific committee, Dr. Monika Kaushal and Dr. Rajesh Sharma. So we started the uh, National Neonatology Forum Emirates branch uh, more than a year ago now. And uh, we were lucky to have the award for the best overseas branch uh, at the Hyderabad National Neonatology Forum uh, conference uh, in December. We all know that since December, we have uh, the start of the coronavirus. Luckily, this was before that started. And from March onwards, the whole world is a transom. Of course, we have lots of webinars and uh, Dr. Satyan was mentioning that uh, he has spoken in nearly 40 odd webinars since this started. So you can imagine that the speakers are much busier than the normal times because you don't need to travel. We are lucky that we can have a speaker of uh, Dr. Satyan's caliber and um, we welcome him to join the session. So uh, for those of you who are uh, from India, very warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. I know it's late in the evening, but because of the working hours in UAE, we had to schedule it at this time. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce the National Neonatology Forum to the colleagues who are from uh, Middle East and other regions. So it was uh, founded in, in India with the view to propagate neonatology in the mid 80s. And it's been uh, a very strong support to neonatal care all over India. And uh, the Emirates branch uh, is continuing with the uh, same passion uh, to keep uh, education at the forefront. And uh, we have a great team here. And um, Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Monika have been at the forefront of establishing this. And uh, we have a great team along with us as well. And we have a Facebook page now for the National Neonatology Forum Emirates chapter, Emirates branch. And I would like you to visit the page and uh, join us as well. So without much ado, I know we have a very interesting topic waiting for us. And I would hand over to Dr. Monika Kaushal. All of you know her. And for those of you who are not familiar, she is a consultant neonatologist. Uh, she uh, has been in Dubai for quite a long time now. And uh, she trained from a postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research Chandigarh for her MD pediatrics. And she did her DM neonatology in Ames. She also did her uh, um, honorary fellowship from the Royal College. She has completed a diploma in neonatology in uh, Southampton University, UK. So she is very passionate about uh, teaching and education. So, uh, Monica, please take over, and uh, I would request you to start the session and introduce Professor Satyan. Thank you, Sridhar, uh, for a kind introduction. Uh, first, the housekeeping uh, uh, I, rules. So, uh, please keep everyone mute. And uh, the question, chat is only for if you have any problems uh, uh, facing in hearing or something. But uh, the question answer, which will be at the end of the session, should be in the question answer uh, part only. Uh, 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 because we will not be able to see the questions put in the chat box. And uh, secondly, uh, at the end of the uh, uh, sessions, we will have a survey. So we need to complete the survey uh, and then only the CME will be uh, sent to you through email after 10 days of this. And uh, uh, with the housekeeping now, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Satyan, which uh, I think he needs no introduction. But I would say I'm not a product of circumstances. I'm a product of my decision and hard work. That that's what we can say for Dr. Satyan, uh, to, uh, the minimum which we can say. After doing his MD from um, India, he moved to US and he did his uh, residency uh, in uh, New York, following which he did his fellowship. And after that, uh, he didn't stop. And we all know that he has done a lot of, lot of research on uh, physiology transition uh, of the uh, newborn. And that's very important. And that's how we are using our resuscitation uh, guidelines uh, from uh, his research. And uh, he's a principal uh, investigator now uh, running a multicentric trial on uh, milirinone uh, in um, PPHN and diaphragmatic hernia. And uh, he's been uh, doing a lot of work on oxygenation of the term and preterm babies. And also he has done a lot of work on uh, this um, newborn uh, congenital heart screening. 
So welcome, Dr. Satin, and we really appreciate uh, that uh, you um, uh, took time, and uh, all of us are uh, keen to hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalyana Sundara, and uh, Dr. Sharma, and Dr. Fikri. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me well. Can you see my slides? Yes, Dr. Satyan, we can see. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, let me start by congratulating NNF UAE for receiving the award at uh, the meeting in Hyderabad. That's really a great achievement, and I congratulate you all uh, for the hard work that went behind it. I also thank Dr. Kaushal for her kind introduction. And uh, without wasting much time, let me get on to the topic. So the topic is on management of PPHN or persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. And I want to focus on what the fetus can teach us. And what the fetus really does is it helps us focus less on oxygen saturation and more on how to make, keep the heart happy. Because the heart is the key organ that dictates outcomes in PPHN. And we need to make sure that we do not stress the heart. And that's the key behind managing PPHN. So I don't have any conflicts of interest. So we all know that the fetus survives nine months of pregnancy with pretty high pulmonary blood pressures and with very low pulmonary blood flow. How does, it, how does this happen? So here there's a depiction of fetal circulation. This diagram is different from what you see in textbooks. What I have shown here is on the y-axis or the vertical axis, we have vascular resistance. So the organs that you see up here, such as the fetal lungs, have high pulmonary vascular resistance. And the organ that you see down here, the placenta, has, low pulmonary, has a low placental vascular resistance. So you know the basic principle is that blood follows the path of least resistance. So it always moves away from the organ of high resistance, which is the lung during fetal life, to placenta, which is the organ of gas exchange during fetal life. And that's what keeps the fetus going in utero. So how does the fetus survive such low pulmonary blood flow? The first thing is that the pulmonary blood flow can be low because lung is not the site of gas exchange and placenta is the site of gas exchange. Two, the right ventricular afterload bypasses the lung and goes to the ductus arteriosus and enters the placenta. For that reason, there is very minimal right ventricular stress during fetal life. Similarly, Having a high hemoglobin F and high cardiac output can maintain oxygen delivery despite low PO2. Remember the PO2 in a fetus is only 25 millimeters of mercury. And despite that low PO2, the baby can survive really well during pregnancy. Moving along, the left ventricular afterload is also low because it's supplying the placenta which has low pulmonary vascular resistance. And because of all these reasons, the fetus is singing a tune don't worry about low PO2 and be happy with less cardiac stress. And that's why the fetus remains well for nine months of pregnancy and thrives well despite low PO2 levels. So once the baby is born, the umbilical arteries are clamped and the systemic arterial resistance goes up. So if you look at the vascular resistance now, the systemic resistance is up here high and the lungs after ventilation, the pulmonary vascular resistance drops and now the blood follows the path of least resistance, which is the lung. And hopefully, if we stay healthy without getting any diseases, this pattern of low pulmonary vascular resistance and high systemic vascular resistance continues for the rest of our lives. However, if things don't go well, and if the baby lands up having PPHN or pulmonary hypertension, the circulation still resembles what it happens during fetal life. And here, the pulmonary vascular resistance is still high often higher than the systemic vascular resistance, and so less blood goes to the lung. Initially, the ductus arteriosus is open, and because of that reason, the right ventricle is able to shunt blood right to left across the ductus arteriosus, and for that reason, the baby is able to survive without causing too much of right ventricular stress. But eventually, the ductus arteriosus closes, and when that happens, there is right ventricular hypertrophy and that leads to right ventricular failure. 
and that's not a good sign in PPHN. So if there is right ventricular afterload that's excessive, there is stress and failure, and the heart is not happy, and that's not a good sign in PPHN, and that's something we need to monitor carefully while uh, dealing with babies with PPHN. So in addition, during PPHN, we go through a vicious cycle. I mentioned to you that there is pulmonary hypertension, there is increased pulmonary vascular resistance, there is pulmonary vasoconstriction and remodel pulmonary vasculature. Because of this reason, there is deviation of the interventricular septum towards the left. And because of that reason, there is bowing of the interventricular septum with reduced left ventricular preload, in turn causing systemic hypotension. This in turn leads to myocardial ischemia due to poor coronary perfusion, and that leads to stretch of the myocardiac myocytes and reduced RV contractility and reduced pulmonary arterial flow. And this in turn leads to the vicious cycle of pulmonary hypertension. The only way to break this cycle is to use a selective pulmonary vasodilator. And one of the examples we have is inhaled nitric oxide. And the second possibility is to use a selective systemic vasoconstrictor but unfortunately, we don't have a really good agent, and that really causes problems while managing babies with PPHN. The real important factor to remain, fact to remain, remind, remind ourselves while managing babies with PPHN is to avoid excessive stress on the myocardium. So we all know that during fetal life, we have physiological pulmonary hypertension. We go through normal transition, and the hypertension is resolved, and the baby does well with increased blood flow to the lungs. On the other hand, if there is asphyxia, hypoxia, acidosis, hypothermia, hyperviscosity, atelectasis, or any kind of lung disease, this normal transition that you expect during birth does not happen, and the abnormal transition leads to persistence of the pulmonary hypertension that occur during fetal life into the neonatal life, and that's why this condition is called persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So what are the causes of PPHN? There are several causes of PPHN that are outlined here in the, the mnemonic tachypnea. T stands for transient tachypnea of newborn. Although TTN is considered to be a transient condition without causing too much of disease, it's not uncommon for patients with TTN to suffer from excessive hypoxemia and land up with PPHN. Meconium aspiration syndrome is a very common cause of PPHN and the incidence of mechanical aspiration syndrome, although it has gone down in some of the developed countries, it continues to be high in many parts of the world. And with now recent onset of hypothermia for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, we are seeing more and more babies with meconium aspiration and asphyxia present with PPHN. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia or CDH is a common cause of intractable pulmonary hypertension. And so is hyaline membrane disease, pneumonia or sepsis, asphyxia, air leaks, maternal ingestion of either aspirin or antidepressants, and all of these are important causes of PPHN. Rarely you see patients with BPD present with PPHN, and I'm not gonna talk about that today. We have pulmonary venous hypertension, which is a totally different condition as well. And finally, there are rare causes such as allelocapillary dysplasia or malalignment of pulmonary veins and surfactant protein and transporter abnormalities. And these are rare and I won't discuss those today as well. So the important thing is to recognize the primary underlying problem. And for that reason, we all use x-rays and we are all familiar with how x-rays look in PPHN. And here are some classic terms that are used to describe PPHN, which I commonly uh, say that it resembles the seven snow white and the seven dwarfs. The seven dwarfs being hazy, which is hyaline membrane disease or pneumonia that you see over here. In some cases, there is graininess or a ground glass appearance, which is also hyaline membrane disease. Then we have patchy areas as seen in this x-ray. This is a kid who had ruby streptococcal pneumonia. Streaky x-rays are suggestive of transient tachypnea of newborn. Here you see sunburst appearance with lots of streakiness and fluid in the minor fissure. And these are features of transient tachypnea of newborn. Then you have meconium aspiration syndrome, hyperexpanded lung, with fluffy infiltrates that you see in this condition. Then you have air leaks, bubbly appearance with pulmonary interstitial emphysema, and in some cases, totally black lungs due to idiopathic pulmonary hypertension or occasionally tetralogy of fallow. And finally, in some cases, you may have massive whiteout, which is the so-called snow white. Here, it could be a complete collapse, effusion, chylothorax, 
or in rare occasions, massive cardiomegaly. This X-ray, in fact, happens to be a case of massive cardiomegaly due to Epstein's anomaly. And we can see little areas of the lung which look normal here. This is a massive heart secondary to Epstein's anomaly. So moving along, what do we do in the delivery room? Say, for example, you're called to the delivery of a baby with diaphragmatic hernia. How will you prepare for this delivery? It's important to know accurate antenatal history as to how big the hernia is and how small the lungs are. And in addition, many places now have started using delayed cord clamping in the management of these cases, especially diaphragmatic hernia. There are ongoing trials in Denver, Philadelphia, and in Europe looking at the effect of delayed cord clamping in babies with diaphragmatic hernia, and that appears to be feasible, although we do not know exactly how beneficial it is. The next thing to make sure in cases of diaphragmatic hernia, as we all know, based on all the multiple choice questions we have answered in our boards, we need to avoid back mask ventilation while managing these patients. Next, we need to tolerate pulse oximetry, which is preductal in the right hand between 85 and 95 percent in the delivery room. We also need to avoid excessive PIP in babies with diaphragmatic hernia because their lungs are small and avoid PIPs over 25 and try using low PEEP in these babies. Obviously, we need to intubate many of these infants and also start orogastric tube suction. Typically, we initiate resuscitation with 50% oxygen in babies with diaphragmatic hernia, mainly because they have such severe pulmonary hypertension. And then if persistent bradycardia with pulse ox less than 80% at five minutes, we continue to increase oxygen. Recently, a protocol was published by Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where you start similar guidelines with FiO2 of 50% with gentle ventilation with low PIP. In, at UC Davis, in my institution, we use low PEEP, somewhere between two to three while managing babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And subsequently, if there is persistent bradycardia, we increase the oxygen to 100%. But if, the, if there is no bradycardia, we continue at 50%. But if pulse ox remains below 80% at five minutes of life, we go ahead and increase the FiO2 in small increments of 10% until we achieve adequate saturation above 85%. So this is the key to managing babies with diaphragmatic hernia in the delivery room, because in diaphragmatic hernia, the lungs are small. We don't want to beat up the lungs and we need to be gentle while handling these lungs. So the key to remember with oxygen is that the important factor is preductal oxygen. That is because the brain and the heart are supplied by blood supply from the aorta before the ductus arteriosus. And for this reason, it's important to monitor the preductal oxygenation closely and consider postductal oxygenation to be reasonably okay as long as the SATs are above 70% if the baby has good urine output and the baby has normal lactate levels. Just give me a second. So let me walk, walk you through a case that I had maybe three years ago where I was managing a baby with meconium aspiration syndrome and it led to severe PPHM. So this was a 29 year old primary mother who came at 46 over seven weeks of gestation with poor fetal movement with severe late decelerations. There was meconium stained amniotic fluid and the baby was delivered by a STAT C-section at 4 a.m. on a Saturday. As you all know, all of these deliveries happen, and all of these deliveries happen on a Friday night or Saturday morning. UPGAR scores were zero at one minute, zero at five minutes, five at 10 minutes and seven at 15 minutes. Baby received intubation, ventilation, initially with 21% oxygen and subsequently increased to 100% oxygen. Baby got chest compressions, one dose of ETT epinephrine and one dose of UV epinephrine. So the baby was really sick with birth asphyxia and meconium aspiration. So the management of meconium aspiration has changed a lot during our years. I've been doing neonatology for 25 years and uh, it has been really important as to how much the management of uh, diaphragmatic hernia has changed. And as you can see here, in the past, in during my residency and fellowship in the 1990s, mothers used to get amnio infusion. As soon as the baby's head was out, we would suction the baby's uh, head at delivery. And then whether the baby was vigorous or non-vigorous, we went ahead and did tracheal suctioning in these babies. But subsequently, many trials have appeared, like the Fraser's trial, which led to stoppage of amnio infusion. Nestor Wayne's trial in Lancet that led to cessation of suctioning at the delivery of the head. 
And finally, Tom Biswell's trial with around 2,994 babies, which led to, which showed that suctioning babies that are vigorous with meconium tracheal suctioning was not effective in reducing the incidence of meconium aspiration syndrome. So for many years, we continued to suction babies that were non-vigorous, but more recently, two papers came out from India, one by Dr. Chetri et al. and one by Dr. Shushma Nanjia. Um, and uh, uh, these have led to cessation of uh, uh, babies that are non-vigorous as well. And we are, not, uh, we are not suctioning these babies also. And there's been a change in the NRP guidelines. Two more recent trials have come out by Dr. Singh and Dr. Kumar. And these have confirmed that suctioning is not very effective even in non-vigorous babies. So coming back to the patient that I was explaining to you, this baby continued to have hypoxemic respiratory failure and baby was had an umbilical arterial gas of 6.99 minus 20 milligrams of base deficit. Baby was flaccid with no suck or moro and there's a plan for whole body hypothermia. Baby was on conventional ventilation at a rate of 22 by five, at a rate of 40 per minute, with a mean airway pressure of 15, with an FiO2 of 70%. The postructural oxygen saturations were 90%, the preductal oxygen saturations were 90%, and postructural were 82%, and the baby was very labile. The umbilical arterial, uh, umbilical arterial ABG showed a pH of 7.02, a PCO2 of 49.5, a PO2 of 35 millimeters of mercury with a base deficit of minus 16.4. And as you can see by the X-ray, this baby had classic meconium aspiration syndrome with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So in babies with asphyxia, when should we suspect a high incidence of PPHN? There are four risk factors that lead to PPHN and that we should be aware of while managing babies with asphyxia. The first is any baby that has severe asphyxia is, is prone to develop PPHN. A baby that requires chest compressions and epinephrine is also at high risk for developing PPHN, partly because epinephrine is also a vasoconstrictor and can cause increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Third, a baby with a predisposing parenchymal lung disease such as meconium aspiration syndrome and pneumonia are also at risk for developing PPHN. So a pre-existing lung disease, especially if the baby requires more than 50% oxygen in the immediate postnatal period, these babies are at very high risk of developing PPHN. So if you go to the delivery room and you are managing a baby that had asphyxia, think of these four conditions. Severe asphyxia, need for chest compressions and epinephrine, pre-existing lung disease, especially meconium aspiration syndrome. And if the baby before you start cooling already has a requirement of 50% oxygen or higher, in these cases, we need to be very careful that because these babies are prone for developing pulmonary hypertension. So more, the more, most common therapy for pulmonary hypertension is giving oxygen and supplemental oxygen is something that we all always commonly use. And why do we give oxygen? The reason why we give oxygen is to meet the tissue oxygen demand, which is calculated by multiplying blood flow with oxygen content. So in addition to oxygen saturation, having adequate blood flow and adding, having adequate hemoglobin is really important in these babies. Secondly, we want to avoid anaerobic metabolism and lactic acidosis. We want to minimize oxidative stress. We want to facilitate growth in these babies, especially babies with BPD. And finally, we want to avoid hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction because hypoxia is a very powerful pulmonary vasoconstrictor and we need to make sure we avoid hypoxia, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So what causes hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction? This is a classic study done in 1966, before many of you in the audience were born, when Abe Rudolph, the eminent cardiologist in San Francisco, he took a bunch of newborn calves and showed that when the PO2 goes below 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury, there's a huge increase in pulmonary vascular resistance causing hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. On the other hand, if the PO2 remained between 60 and 80, the pulmonary vascular resistance was low, but if the PO2 went up higher than 120, there was no further reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance. So what he showed us was hypoxia causes pulmonary vasoconstriction, normoxia causes pulmonary vasodilation, but hyperoxia does not cause additional pulmonary vasodilation. 
We have done similar studies in lamps, and we have shown that maintaining oxygen saturation pre-ductal between 90 to 98 results in very low pulmonary vascular resistance in various models of lung disease. And becoming hypoxic below saturations of 85, especially, results in severe increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. So this is the range we use while managing babies with PPHN. The other thing to remember is that a combination of perinatal asphyxia with postnatal hyperoxia increases the risk of HIE. One of my close friends, Vishal Kapadia, has shown that on the first blood gas that you get after an asphyxial episode, if the blood gas had high PO2, especially above 115 millimeters of mercury, the risk of that baby developing hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy was much higher. So avoid PO2 above 100 millimeters of mercury in the immediate postnatal phase following resuscitation of any baby that has that had asphyxia and required resuscitation because a combination of, combination of postnatal hyperoxia along with perinatal asphyxia increases the risk of HIE in these babies. So once the babies are diagnosed with HIE, many of us institute whole body cooling, and that's a very important step, especially, but you need to remember that deep cooling below 33 degrees centigrade can exacerbate pulmonary hypertension and worsen oxygenation. And that's why it's really important to maintain cooling between 33 and 34 degrees centigrade, preferably at 33.5 degrees centigrade core temperature. So these are some results from Dr. Sita Shankaran's trials on hypothermia. And what she has shown is that if you cool babies to 33.5 degrees centigrade, the incidence of PPHN is around 25%. On the other hand, if you cool babies down to 32 degrees centigrade, the incidence of PPHN is much higher at 34%. In other words, one out of four infants with HIE undergoing hypothermia, standard hypothermia, have PPHN. On the other hand, if you do deep hypothermia to 32 degrees centigrade, one out of three infants has PPHN. So this is really important to remember. So when you're cooling babies for hypothermia, you need to make sure that we avoid deep cooling below 33.5 degrees centigrade. So moving along, what are the features of pulmonary hypertension? The classic feature is labile oxygenation and differential oxygenation. So what do we mean by labile oxygenation? Unlike babies that have congenital heart disease, babies with PPHN, the oxygenation keeps changing quite a bit. One minute, the baby might be sat in 89 and 87, and the second minute, the baby will deoxygenate de with sats in the 70s. And this goes back and forth, and such a labile appearance is a classic feature of PPHN. In addition, there is a preductal postductal difference if there is a shunt across the PDA. So the preductal sats will be much higher than the postductal sats in babies that have an open PDA and a right to left shunt. In some cases, especially with black lung PPHN, the hypoxemia is disproportional to the degree of parenchymal lung disease. And if echo is available, don't waste time on a hypoxia hyperventilation test, directly go to an echo, and the echocardiogram shows evidence of tricuspid regurgitation, right atrial hypertension with the right to left shunt across the PFO, right to left shunt across the PDA, and bowing of the interventricular septum towards the left. And these are the classic features of PPHN on an echocardiogram. Going back to the baby that I was describing to you, the baby was switched from to a high frequency oscillator. The mean airway pressure was increased to 25. The blood gas was 729 with a PCO2 of 19 pH of PO2 of 50 with a base deficit of minus 18. So the baby's oxygenation is getting better, but the baby's carbon dioxide is really low and the baby is already 100% O2. So if you calculate the OI in this baby, the baby's oxygenation index is right now 50. So what is the next step? Should we adjust ventilator settings or should we start inhaled nitric oxide in this baby? The key thing here is that the CO2 is really, really low and that's not a good sign. So let's talk about hypercarbia and hypoxemia. Let's imagine that one of you is going for a walk and then you want to explore a cave and you enter a cave. Once you're in a cave, there's an avalanche and lots of rocks fall, blocking your entry and also starting to minimize your oxygen status. So right now you're suffering from hypoxia and hypercarbia. And when you're in such a state, the key organ that needs to work well is your brain. 
because your brain needs adequate blood supply for you to think as to how to get out of this trouble and get out of this cave. So for that reason, both hypoxia and hypercarbia tend to increase cerebral blood flow and tend to optimize cerebral function. So again, increasing CO2 and in decreasing PO2, both of that lead to increased cerebral blood flow. On the other hand, increasing PO2 and decreasing CO2 cause cerebral vasoconstriction, especially low CO2 is a very powerful cerebral vasoconstrictor. So here is a graph showing adult and newborn levels with CO2. So if the CO2 is around 40, you have adequate amount of blood supply. On the other hand, if the CO2 is high, then you have more blood supply, but if the CO2 is low, then you start causing reduced blood flow to the brain with cerebral oligemia. So reduced carbon dioxide leads to reduced cerebral blood flow. When you don't supply the brain with adequate blood flow, it results in bad outcomes and that's not good. So the evidence of this is shown in this trial by Athena Pappas and Dr. Sita Shankaran. What they did was during the first 12 hours of cooling, they looked and checked out as to how many blood gases had a CO2 of less than 35. If the baby's baby had no blood gases with a CO2 of less than 35, these babies had a 35% chance of death or disability at two years of age follow up. On the other hand, if the baby spent a lot of time, 60 to 64% of their time being exposed to PaCO2 of less than 35, their chance of death or disability by two years of age was over 60%. So a low CO2 just in the first 12 hours of age has huge long-term impact, not only in terms of mortality, but also neurodevelopmental disability. And these babies were followed up at two years, so the effect persisted. So it's really important to remember that we need to avoid low PCO2, especially less than 35 millimeters of mercury when managing babies with PPHN that are being cooled for asphyxia. So I've been a, I was a neonatology fellow way back in the 1990s. And the way we managed babies with PPHN at that time when we didn't have nitric oxide was to give them an infusion of sodium bicarbonate beat the lungs up to get rid of every molecule of carbon dioxide and give up every take up every molecule of oxygen and it was not unusual for us to maintain babies with a ph of 775 pco2 of 22 po2 of 212 with a positive base excess of plus 9.5 for those of you in the audience who are as old as i am i'm sure this these gases are very familiar to you and it was not uncommon for us to manage these babies this way so what we were trying to do is to make this poor baby's lungs and heart run so fast that the baby had to maintain high PO2s in this range and low CO2s in this range. And along came a new concept called as gentle ventilation. And in gentle ventilation, what is done is that the PO2 target is lowered all the way to 50 to 60, and the PCO2 target is all the way increased to somewhere in the 50s and 60s, 40s and 50s. And for this reason, this is considered to be lung protective ventilation. And the person singularly responsible for promoting this is Dr. Jen Wong from Columbia University in New York, who promoted gentle ventilation, and he called it tolerable hypoxemia with preductal SATs between 90 and 97, with PO2 between 50 and 80, and permissive hypercapnia with PCO2 in the 50 to 60 range with pH above 725. And this approach minimizes cardiac stress and keeps the babies happy. And if the heart is happy, the baby is happy and the baby does well. So it's always important to focus on the heart. So what is the role of cerebral and pulmonary circulation in these babies? And what's the effect of hemoglobin, pH, and PaCO2? It's important to know that low hemoglobin increases blood flow to the brain and high PCO2 increases blood flow to the brain. On the other hand, low CO2 improves blood flow to the lung so the brain and the lung behave in exactly opposite directions as far as CO2 and pH are concerned. So we have done some studies in the labs to show that if you follow the approach of a fetus where you maintain high hemoglobin in the 14 to 17 gram range and also maintain high CO2, you land up getting a lot of blood flow to your brain. And so maintaining a CO2 between 50 and 60 while managing PPHN ensures that there is lots of blood supply to the brain. On the other hand, 
anemia and is a big factor in causing reduced blood flow to the lung as well. So a combination of anemia with lower CO2 tends to reduce blood flow to the lung and exacerbates PPHN. So it's prudent while managing babies with PPHN to maintain hemoglobin at least above 10, if not higher, and to avoid very low CO2 values. So the general overline is that, is that while, man, while cooling babies with PPHN, maintain PAO2s in the 50 to 80 millimeters range, maintain PCO2 when it's corrected in the 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury range. But if you're not managing with hypothermia, this is regular PPHN without HIE, you can go on your CO2 all the way up to 51 to 60 millimeters of mercury, but always maintain a pH above 725. So the next agent that we commonly use while managing babies with PPHN is surfactant. And Dr. Kunduri, one of my close friends who has done a lot of work in this area has stated that in the presence of lung disease and PPHN, all causes except idiopathic or black lung PPHN, administration of surfactant was associated with a threefold reduction in the need for ECMO or death. And for this reason, in babies with severe PPHN and hypoxemic respiratory failure, it's really important to give surfactant before starting agents such as inhaled nitric oxide. So recruiting the lung is really, really important. For example, if you think of this to be a lung without surfactant, there's all kinds of lung disease here, asymmetric expansion of the lung because of Laplace's law, and in such a condition, if you give inhaled nitric oxide, the inhaled nitric oxide cannot e well distribute through the alveoli. And because of this reason, the nitric oxide cannot reach the pulmonary vasculature and cannot induce pulmonary vasodilation. On the other hand, if you give surfactant and if you use adequate PEEP to open up the lungs uniformly, then inhaled nitric oxide can reach every alveolus and induce pulmonary vasodilation, resulting in reduced pulmonary vascular resistance and improved PAO2. So giving surfactant first and recruiting the lung is really key prior to administering inhaled nitric oxide in babies with PPHN, secondary to parenchymal lung disease. So moving along, um, hypoxemic respiratory failure is really common in many of these babies and should we use inhaled nitric oxide next? Because inhaled nitric oxide is a very common agent that's used. The key thing to check before using inhaled nitric oxide is to make sure that the baby does not have left ventricular dysfunction. A baby with left ventricular dysfunction has elevated left atrial pressures, and because the left atrial pressures are high, many of these babies suffer from pulmonary venous hypertension because the pressure in the pulmonary veins is also high. So when this happens, if you go ahead and give inhaled nitric oxide to these babies, inhaled nitric oxide opens up the arterial side of the circulation, and pours a lot of additional blood into the lung, but the pulmonary venous hypertension and the dysfunctional left ventricle prevents this blood from draining back to the heart. And for that reason, these babies develop pulmonary edema and their lung function deteriorates. So this is similar to having a sink with a clogged drain, which is the dysfunctional left ventricle. And if you turn on the faucet here, it only floods the sink and causes more damage. On the other hand, in these babies, it's important to use a drug such as mildenone to improve the function of the left ventricle so the left ventricle can function better and then you can go ahead and use inhaled nitric oxide. Such left ventricular dysfunction is very common in asphyxia, during hypothermia, in congenital diaphragmatic hernia and also in sepsis. The key to diagnosing left ventricular dysfunction is a combination of a suprasystemic pulmonary arterial pressures with a right to left shunt across the ductus arteriosus but when you look at the PFO, instead of the shunt being here right to left, the shunt is reverse, it's left to right. So this combination of LV dysfunction, a right to left shunt across the PDA, and a left to right shunt across the PFO is suggestive of poor outcomes in many babies. So we have done a small study looking at the effect of mildenone, and as you can see here, mildenone results in improved oxygenation and reduction in oxygenation index in babies that are overall you know, responders. So how do we use inhaled nitric oxide? There are two basic rules for using inhaled nitric oxide. When to start and when to stop. When to start nitric oxide, I use the 20-20-20 rules. When the oxygenation index is approximately 20, the dose is 20 parts per million. 
And when you give nitric oxide, there should be a good response with an improvement in the PaO to FiO2 ratio of more than 20 millimeters of mercury. When do you wean inhaled nitric oxide? I call it the 30, 60, 90 rule now. So you wait for 60, initially we used to call it 60, 60, 60 rule where we waited for 60 minutes and waited till the FiO2 went below 60% and waited till the PaO2 improved above 60%. But nowadays we don't draw as many blood gases and we follow oxygen saturations. So this rule has been modified to 30, 60, 90 rule. So 60 minutes after, 30 minutes after giving inhaled nitric oxide, if the baby is less than 60% oxygen, and if the pre-rectal oxygen saturation is more than 90%, it's time to start turning the nitric oxide down. This is really important because a combination of high doses of nitric oxide and high concentration of oxygen, especially 100%, can lead to formation of peroxynitrite, and that's not good for babies. So it's really important to wean oxygen first, bring it down to 60%, and then start weaning inhaled nitric oxide. The next thing to keep an eye on is uh, systemic blood pressure. For example, if you have a baby who, with PPHN who underwent an echo and is noticed to have a PA pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury, but then when you check your umbilical arterial line pressure, if that pressure is only 64 millimeters of mercury, the common approach is to give this baby more dopamine so that the systemic blood pressure also goes above 90 millimeters of mercury so that the right to left shunt across the PFO and the PDA can stop. So such excessive use of dopamine is not a good approach and I will tell you why. It's important to note that dopamine is not a selective agent for systemic circulation. In this graph, you see that when dopamine goes up from zero to 40 mics per kg per minute, there is not only an increase in systemic blood pressure, but there is also an increase in pulmonary arterial pressure as shown by dotted lines and this increase in pulmonary arterial pressure occurs much more significantly in babies with PPHN. This study was done in lambs, but I'm assuming that similar results will be seen in babies. Blood vessels in babies with PPHN are very twitchy and responsive to dopamine. So increasing doses of dopamine, especially above 15 mics per kg per minute, will increase your pulmonary vascular resistance also. And for this reason, it's important to avoid excessive doses of dopamine when managing babies with PPHN. So the second issue with using high doses of dopamine is that normally in babies with PPHN, the right ventricular is happy because it's able to shunt blood through two pop-off valves, one at the PDA level and one at the PFO level. This is almost like having a pressure cooker where the steam is going off the valve and the cooker is happy. But then if you increase the left-handed pressures really, really, really high using dopamine, then it's almost like putting a weight on the cooker preventing these pop-off valves. And if this continues for a long time, you will end up having right ventricular failure. So it's important to avoid increasing the blood pressure to suprasystemic levels while managing babies with PPHN. So the rule again from the fetus is do not stress the heart, keep the heart happy. So what are the drugs that we use for maintaining blood pressure? If the blood pressure is normal and the cardiac function is normal, you just continue monitoring. If the blood pressure is low and the cardiac function is normal, the ideal drugs are norepinephrine and vasopressin. If the cardiac function is abnormal, then the preferred drug is mildenone. But if you have poor cardiac function and low blood pressure, then you can use dopamine or epinephrine. But these cases are more likely to land up on ECMO and you should be careful with these patients. So here are the doses of various drugs and this will be in your handout. So you can just look this up in any textbook. So the key to managing PPHN is to reduce after load by using inhaled nitric oxide in, in the absence of LV dysfunction. Consider using surfactant, and if these two don't work, consider using IV sildenafil. Keep the stress on the heart to the minimal extent possible. Improve heart function using mildenone. And if the after load is high, consider keeping the ductus open by using prostaglandin E1. So to conclude, Keeping the heart happy is the essence of managing PPHN. Keep oxygen levels between 90 to 97% pre-ductal. Brief periods of tolerable hypoxemia and permissive hypercapnia do not significantly increase RV strain. Hemodynamic management optimally with isoprinopropes is important. Avoid extremely high doses of dopamine to increase systemic blood pressure to supraphysiological levels. Optimal ventilation to maintain CO2 in the 50s is good. 
inhale nitric oxide in selected patients. Maintaining an open ductus may reduce the strain on the right ventricle. And be careful while using steroids in PPHN, especially if there is suspected viral, bacterial, or candidal sepsis. There was one kid with TPHN where I used a high dose of hydrocortisone, and that baby had congenital cytomegalovirus sepsis, and there was another baby who had herpes simplex virus. And these infections really exacerbate when you use high dose steroids. So be careful while using steroids. Make sure that there is no infection. And also to conclude, there are a lot of similarities between food and oxygen. We know for a long time that we have always craved for food. And for that reason, now we have too much of food and we don't know how to deal with it. But on the other hand, it's important to remember that starvation is equally bad. And so both hypoxia and hyproxia are bad for babies. So starvation and hypoxia can be lethal. Then it's very clear from the support trial and other studies, boost, et cetera, that extreme hypoxemia with SATs below 85% and severe acidosis with pH less than 725 can give rise to problems and cause death in babies with PPHN and have, should be avoided. At the same token, we are used to dealing with mild hypoxia throughout our lives. By destiny in utero, every single one of us were hypoxic when we were a fetus. Our PO2 was 25 millimeters of mercury and our body knew how to deal with it. Through disease, if you and I develop a pneumonia, we will become hypoxic and our body knows how to deal with it to a certain extent. By desire, if we climb up the Mount Everest, we will be hypoxic and our body knows how to deal with it. On the other hand, there is no natural cause for hyperoxia. And there is only one cause for hyperoxia, which is iatrogenic. Unless you and I give more oxygen to these babies, they will not become hyperoxic. And the poor body, from an evolutionary standpoint, is not attuned to deal with hyperoxia the way it is attuned to deal with hypoxia. So oxygen is a drug, so try to use it judiciously. And I thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Satyan. Um, and I would say that we are what we repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is not an act, but a habit. That's for you. And let me tell the audience as well that these all cartoons which he had shown uh, were made by him. So, and we all use them. Uh, all uh, his efforts we are using uh, every day. So uh, can we uh, uh, open the house for questions? Can you put uh, Dr. Satin on the screen as well? And uh, Sridhar? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Ayaz uh, is um, asking um, that, uh, is there any role of surfactant therapy in meconium aspiration syndrome, which you already answered that yes, uh, there is. And then the, and another question is uh, by Dr. Jagan Mohan. Most of the asphyxia babies will have a severe metabolic acidosis and hypocarbia. Is it okay to take corrected PCO2? Corrected PCO2 in the sense of uh, correcting for temperature or correcting the CO2? Um, uh, that's what he has written. I don't know what does he mean. Uh, is it okay to take corrected PCO2? Yes, so, so let me share the screen for just one second, if I may. Um, so um, I presume the, uh, it's, the question being asked is as to whether it's okay to correct PCO2 for, um, for hypothermia. So we always correct PCO2 for hypothermia or the baby's body temperature. So there are two methods of uh, analyzing CO2 during PPHN management during cooling. One is called the pH stat method, where you correct blood gases for the PCO2 for the temperature and then use that method. And the second method called as alpha stat method, where you always check blood gases at 37 degrees centigrade. All the trials have been done using the pH stat method so correcting blood gases for baby's temperature is the right way to do in these babies because that leads to slightly higher CO2 levels and that provides more blood flow to the brain and causes more uniform cooling of the brain. And that's really important. 
thank you. The next question is by Dr. Yasser. What is the role of magnesium sulfate and bosantan in PPHN? So I, have, I don't have much experience with magnesium sulfate. I'm, uh, I've read a paper that came out uh, a few years ago uh, from your region uh, showing that it's effective. Uh, bosantan is, is definitely a fairly effective drug, although a recent trial conducted by my mentor, Dr. Robin Steinhorn, showed that bosantan was not very effective in a randomized control trial. But we do use bosantan in patients with intractable pulmonary hypertension, where you have gone past inhaled nitric oxide and sildenafil, and if there's still intractable pulmonary hypertension, then we have gone ahead and used bosantan, especially in babies with diaphragmatic hernia. Most often before starting bosentan, you need to make sure we check liver function tests and if possible, check cardiac cath because some of these patients have pulmonary vein stenosis and we really don't want to miss that. So a cardiac cath and a baseline liver function test is ideal before starting a drug like bosentan. Thank you, Dr. Satin. Uh, so Amya is asking uh, what about feeding in this PPHN babies? So if the baby's hemodynamics are reasonably stable, we continue trophic feeds with the orogastric tube. And, uh, uh, and the issue is many times these are asphyxiated babies and asphyxia, as you know, is a risk factor for NEC. So in those babies, you need to be a little cautious. If there is access to breast milk, preferably mother's own breast milk or even donor's breast milk, that would be the ideal food to give these babies. So. As soon as the baby is a little better and the dopamine levels are coming down, we are happy to feed these babies. And I think feeding keeps them much more sedated and it's easy to wean sedatives when you're on feeds. Uh, another question is by Rola, uh, do you keep less PEEP like two, three? I mean, I, I don't know if someone can keep that, but uh, yeah, Dr. Satin, I want to take that question. Um, so I didn't go into, I took, I had more slides and I thought I would run out of time. So I took them out. So uh, patients with PPHN are classified into two categories. The first category is hyperplastic lungs, as you see in diaphragmatic hernia. And in these babies, you have to practice lung protective ventilation. In these patients, using a low PEEP initially might be effective. On the other hand, you have babies with meconium aspiration syndrome, pneumonia and other parenchymal lung diseases where a low PEEP will not work. And in these cases, you should avoid having PEEPophobia and use adequate PEEP and mean airway pressure. So you need to first determine based on your x-ray if the baby has hypoplastic lungs, where you need to resort to very protective ventilation, ventilatory mechanisms, or if the baby has parenchymal lung disease, where you need to use lung recruitment therapy. So the PEEP of two to three is only for initial management of babies with diaphragmatic hernia. And in some cases, it, do it doesn't work and immediately have to go up on the PEEP. So that's exclusively for babies with hyperplastic lungs. Continuing with the same kind of uh, question, like uh, Dr. Ismail is asking, how much tidal volume would you recommend uh, for a case of uh, diaphragmatic hernia with PPHN? So that answer to that question is based on um, prenatal studies and what the lung to head ratio is, or if you have fetal lung volume measurements by MRI during fetal life, if you have those, you can use those to figure out how much to give. I typically use four ml per kg tidal volume. Part of the problem in babies with diaphragmatic hernia is that not only the ipsilateral lung is severely hypoplastic, but the contralateral lung is also slightly small. And the other unique feature in diaphragmatic hernia is that the trachea is capable of ballooning when during ventilation and the trachea takes up some amount of tidal volume. And for this reason, I typically use four ml per kg when I use volume targeted ventilation in babies with diaphragmatic hernia. Another question uh, is, uh, is by Dr. Sangvi. Now, is oral sildenafil as effective as IV? Um, the answer is yes and no. Uh, there are trials showing that oral sildenafil is quite effective and many of us have used oral sildenafil and it, it works quite well. Just like in adults, sildenafil is around 40% absorbed by the intestine. In babies, in healthy babies, the absorption is also around 40%. But the fact that what we don't know is if you have severe PPHN with liver dysfunction, and that has led to some degree of intestinal edema, 
with right ventricular failure, in those patients, we do not know how well oral cylindrical is absorbed. But studies have shown that it's quite effective and it's, it's known to reduce mortality in PPHN if, when used as a single agent. So uh, come, if you have access to IV cylindrical, I would definitely prefer to use IV in acute PPHN. But if you don't have access, oral is definitely worth trying. But the dose is different. The dose is very different. Yeah. Uh, dose, I think they should see uh, uh, from the view uh, uh, Dr. Shamnath is asking indication for surfactant in term neonates with PPHN. So any, any patient with parenchymal lung disease, we can use surfactant. Uh, we use it a lot in my unit. Uh, we use it in babies with PPHN secondary to meconium aspiration syndrome, we use it in babies secondary to hyaline membrane disease in late preterm infants, we use it in pneumonia. So any baby that has parenchymal lung disease leading to PPHN, I actually use surfactant first before using inhaled nitric oxide because that helps the lung open up and makes inhaled nitric oxide a lot more effective. So I truly believe in using surfactant in every single patient with parenchymal lung disease. Um, another question is by Dr. Sushil. He's asking, could you please repeat the indication of starting prostaglandin in PPHN? So prostaglandin, prostaglandin E1, I mean, there are obviously different kinds of prostaglandins, prostacyclins and prostaglandin E1. I was mainly focusing on PGE1. So in babies that are showing signs of right ventricular dysfunction, if the ductus is beginning to get closed and the RV dysfunction is getting worse, it's important to keep the ductus open so that the ventricular strain does not go up. The most common reason for babies to go on ECMO in PPHN is right ventricular failure. And keeping their RV happy is the key to success in managing babies with PPHN. So if I see patients with PPHN suffering from RV failure and their ductus is getting narrower, in those cases, I use IVPGE1. It's important to remember that IVPGE1 is also a good pulmonary vasodilator. So it functions both, it, it serves both purposes, opens the ductus arteriosus and opens up the pulmonary circulation also. Um, another question by Dr. Abhijit is, uh, what's your experience uh, of pulmonary hypertension in established BPD? How to diagnose, especially because it's hard to detect echo and how to do, and how do you manage them? I think it will be a different- That will be another talk. So another, I another. avoided we will be, I think we'll take it in someone because it will be another full uh, uh, thing. So we'll take it another time. Yeah. Okay. What are, uh, by Shri, uh, Shreesh Bhatt, uh, what are the saturation limits in preterm babies with VPHN? Uh, shall we go with higher limits? So there are no trials of evaluating saturation targets in preterm babies with VPHN. Um, as you, as you all know, the CART trial and some other trials that evaluated optimal oxygen saturation in preterm babies avoided or excluded babies with pulmonary hypertension. So we don't know the real answer to it. I personally use the same target range that I use in term babies. Um, and what is recommended by Dr. Abman and his colleagues in the AHA circulation guidelines is maintaining SATs in the low 90s. So 91 to 95 is what most people use while managing babies with PPHN, with managing preterm babies with PPHN. But we do not have uh, either uh, animal studies or uh, clinical studies evaluating the optimal oxygen saturation in preterm babies with PPHN. Um, Dr. Handney, uh, Sabri is asking, any role of bicarb if you have a severe acidosis with the meconium aspiration in HIE and PPHN? So the, I often tell my residents that uh, when they take their board exams, there are three answers that are always wrong in board exams. One is sodium bicarb, the second is formula feeds and avoiding breast feeds, and the last is doing a C-section. So just like you, anytime you have, you're asked a question about bicarbonate, the answer is no, but practically speaking, all of us use sodium bicarbonate. And the main thing to remember while using it is to use the infusion really slowly and avoid doses more than one to two milliequivalents per kg of sodium bicarbonate. So if you have a baby with severe acidosis with significant kusmalling and low PCO2, 
I do give them a small dose of sodium bicarbonate, but it's important to remember that large doses of sodium bicarbonate can cause intracellular acidosis and further depress the myocardium. So I probably use it five times in a year, which is fairly uncommon, uh, but I do use it occasionally in the context of the question I was asking. Uh, Dr. Akash is asking role of vasopressin and prostacyclines in PPHN. So I think you answered one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, prostacyclines, if you're referring to uh, prostacycline or PGI2, both inhaled and IV forms are used occasionally in intractable pulmonary hypertension. Uh, but you need to be careful about uh, avoiding systemic hypertension with those agents. Uh, vasopressin is a really wonderful drug. I use it a lot for short-term management of hypotension in, in PPHN because vasopressin, unlike dopamine, does not cause pulmonary vasoconstriction in babies. And so that's a huge advantage. But the problem with vasopressin is that many babies develop oliguria and significant hyponatremia. We just had a baby with a sodium of 124 uh, with, uh, with uh, vasopressin use. So you should be really careful before you use vasopressin in babies with PPHN, but it is a good drug and lots of people use it. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi is asking higher uh, no non-responders and hypotension, uh, those who are not responding, um, and that comes as a major issue, what to do for those babies? Well, if you have access to ECMO, ECMO is the answer, uh, because the longer you wait to send a baby to an ECMO center, the worse the outcomes are. So if the baby meets criteria for ECMO, the baby should be sent. On the other hand, if there is no access to ECMO, then in these babies, a appropriate combination of inhaled nitric oxide and epinephrine or vasopressin usually helps them. Uh, but it's really important to keep an eye on frequent echoes and the cardiac status and avoid trying to get to that point. So I personally prefer using epi in those patients uh, because epinephrine has good inotropic effect and also it has some pulmonary vas has uh, also has systemic vasoconstrictor effect. So use a combination of inhaled nitric oxide and epinephrine along with prostaglandin E1 for managing those babies. Okay. Uh, one question is uh, OPA. Uh, I don't know uh, the name if it is OPA. Uh, Post-ductal saturation sometimes is more than the pre-ductal. Is there any reason? Yeah, so physiologically that cannot be explained, but it's very commonly seen. And there are two reasons for it. One is that in babies, the way that the, the feet are really nice and chunky and you can place the pulse ox probe much more accurately around the foot than you can on the wrist or on the hand. For that reason, the readings in the lower limb are, are usually a little higher. And interestingly, when we have done studies for CCHD screening in large number of babies, you do see that the postductal saturations are slightly higher than preductal. And um, we can't really explain it based on the shunting or any other reason. But I think it's a matter of adequate blood flow and the way the pulse ox is applied. So there are causes for what is called as the reverse differential cyanosis, where postductal numbers are much higher than preductal. And that typically is due to having a toxic being anomaly or a combination of transposition of great vessels along with PPHN, which is very uncommon. But it's not, I totally agree with the uh, person who asked that question that we do see it fairly more often than we should. And there is no easy, exp I have done echoes on babies that show such saturations and you really can't find anything wrong. And, and uh, I truly believe that the way the pulse ox probe is applied on the foot tends to pick up really high values compared to the hand. Another question is by Dr. Srish Bhatt, uh, pH in pulmonary hemorrhage, so uh, what to do in these patients and uh, what dose of INO to be given for them? Um, it's very tricky to manage babies with pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, partly because there is significant surfactant inactivation with pulmonary hemorrhage. So in many of these babies, I tend to treat them with a dose of surfactant first and then use slightly higher PEEP to tamponade the pulmonary vasculature so that I can stop the bleeding. And once that occurs, once the lung is adequately recruited and the alveoli are not filled with blood, uh, we can try a dose of inhaled nitric oxide. Uh, there used to be some concern in the past that inhaled nitric oxide can prolong bleeding by causing some amount of platelet dysfunction, but that uh, is thought to be more theoretical and that hasn't been shown commonly in term babies. But in preterm babies, 
especially preterm babies with the large ductus, pulmonary hemorrhage is really common and is tough to manage. Um, Let me just check. I mean, we have more than 90 questions. Uh, Professor Satin, how much time do you have? Uh, I have, I need to leave at 10.45 uh, my time, so I have uh, seven more minutes. Okay. okay. So, so there is an interesting question, Monica. I'll just uh, ask this. I mean, there is one uh, from uh, Dr. Shailesh Patel. He says, uh, we usually target saturation above 95% in PPHN. So how do we justify the role of 30, 60, 90 for nitric oxide. So this is about nitric oxide weaning, but he he means the general teaching that you keep the saturation above 95%. Um, there is no definite evidence that maintaining saturations above 95 is helpful in PPHN. Um, the main thing is you should avoid SATs of 99 to 100% for sure, because when the SATs are 99 to 100%, the blood gas can show PaO2 anywhere from 60 to 600, and there is no way to know that unless you're drawing frequent blood gases. So I usually tell, I usually avoid SATs of 99 and 100 for sure, and keep the PO2 between, SATs between 90 and 98. It's a fairly wide range and easy to maintain. So it's not very difficult while maintaining such a wide range. So targeting saturations above 95 typically leads to prolonged periods of 100% oxygen, 100% uh, O2 sats, and that's something that needs to be avoided. And that's the reason why I tend to put an upper limit to sats. So any baby who is on supplemental oxygen in the NICU should not be satting 100%, period. If the baby is in room air and satting 100%, that's okay. But any baby, term or preterm, who is on supplemental oxygen should not saturate 100% at all. And we should avoid that at all costs. Um. One question is by Chandra is, uh, if a baby is not improving after 30 minutes on nitric oxide, how long to wait and how much to go up on NO? Uh, I typically don't go more than 20 parts per million because uh, studies have shown that uh, only 6% of babies respond to a dose higher than 20, which is if you go from 20 to 80, for example, the number of babies that show additional responses is very low. And so I typically don't do that. Uh, the key is to make sure the lung is recruited. Most often, the commonest reason for why NO does not work is because NO is a nice, fancy drug and we all like to use it. But without the lung being open, there is no point in giving nitric oxide. It cannot reach its target organ, which is the blood, pulmonary arterial blood vessel. So opening the lung is really crucial. So after 30 minutes of inhaled nitric oxide, if there is no response, make sure the hemodynamics are okay make sure the ventilation is okay. And if both are good, and if you have absolutely no response to NO, then I take the INO out. There is no point in continuing INO at that time. So I would stop it and then try other agents such as mildenone or sildenafil. So I think you made a very important point about uh, I mean, the extra load to the left atrium. And that's where you consider. So if there is a relative worsening, when you start nitric, you should go to mildenone fairly quickly, isn't it? That's correct. Uh, um, especially if you're transporting a baby from a center that does not have echo, uh, this is really important because we have had experiences transferring a baby with a hypoplastic left heart or some other LV dysfunction. Uh, we also had a baby who came in uh, on a transport, was on nitric oxide and had significant deterioration on nitric oxide. And it turned out that the baby has group B strep sepsis. And before we could cannulate the baby, although the baby was on antibiotics, baby died and the autopsy showed lots of group B strep in the lung. So sepsis, asphyxia, and diaphragmatic hernia are common causes of LV dysfunction, as you rightly mentioned, Dr. Sridhar. And in these cases, if NO is not showing a good response, we should get an echocardiogram to make sure there is no LV dysfunction. Yeah. I think uh, since uh, you have to leave quickly, I mean, uh, I think it would be good to summarize uh, because you have two, three minutes more. So, uh, I mean, do you wish to, uh, I mean, there are plenty of questions. I'm sure we can find some way to answer those questions at the end of the session and maybe email it to all participants. So, I mean, uh, do you want to summarize in a couple of minutes as to what the key messages you want to convey? Sure. Um, the key message while managing PPHN is to focus less on oxygen saturations and to make sure the heart function is good. So a cardiologist, or if you know how to do your own echoes, uh, somebody who can do echoes is your best friend while managing PPHN. 
frequent assessment of cardiac function is the key. So starting with oxygenation, pre-rectal SATs, 90 to 97 or 90 to 98 is ideal. Uh, don't worry about post-rectal SATs as long as they're above 70 and the baby is passing adequate urine and there is no lactic acidosis. CO2, I like to keep them between 50 and 60, but if you're doing whole body cooling, sometimes it's better to use 45 to 55. So CO2 is slightly variable based on baby's temperature. A pH has to be about 725 because acidosis tends to cause increased hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. With regards to inhaled NO, uh, start at 20 parts per million, and typically you see a fairly good response, especially if you recruited the lung with adequate PEEP and then gave inhaled nitric oxide, then it works really well. And in cases of parenchymal lung disease, either meconium aspiration syndrome, um, pneumonia, or RDS, give surfactant and then give nitric oxide. In many cases, after you give surfactant, you won't even have to give inhaled nitric oxide. And uh, finally, uh, vasopressors are helpful, but using excessive doses of dopamine might not really help in some babies because you want to maintain physiological systemic blood pressure, which is, in my opinion, the upper limit is 85 by 55 millimeters of mercury. Maintaining targeting higher numbers than that will always cause problems. Uh, Dr. Satyan, in the chat box, there are so many, so many, so many thanks uh, for your uh, really wonderful lecture. And I think there are so many more questions. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, I will just email them and if you can answer and we can mail the participants back, that would be uh, uh, good, I think, because we can't take uh, all these questions because of the time constraint. And thank you very much for uh, giving us so much of your time. And uh, we all enjoyed and uh, Really, we appreciate your presence. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you, Dr. 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 Thank you